Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is 10 to Life, where we talk everything true crime. So, you've heard it before, but I'll say it again. We talk about everything new, old, current, crazy, conspiracy, wild, heartbreaking, sad, inspiring. I mean, not inspiring, I guess. I mean, kind of. I don't know. Whatever. Not inspiring unless you're like a psychopath, but sometimes these victim stories are inspiring, so we'll just roll with that. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Lots to talk about today. It's early in the week. Um, okay, so my name is Annie Elise, and this is 10 to Life. So, if you are brand new and you appreciate today's case coverage and think that this is a channel you want to check out again in the future, make sure to hit that red subscribe button below. And for all of my returning 10 to lifers, welcome back. As always, I am so happy to have you here with me today. Today we've got a wild one and I want to go ahead and warn you about this story because it is very shocking and absolutely heartbreaking in many ways. This story is still very fresh to those close to it and to others who identify closely with the victims. I also want to make it clear that there are two deaths in this story, but there are eight victims in total. Now, I know the math doesn't quite add up yet, but trust me, we are going to get there. So guys, let's jump right in. Sent to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. In life, some of us have grown to learn that not all aspects of our full personality are acceptable in every situation. A lot of us can go into a situation and judge it, whether it be social, educational, or professional, and kind of assess the situation and know how to act. I mean, most of the time anyway. I also think it's fair to say that a lot of us assess a situation based on our past experiences or past mistakes. It's taught us how to carry ourselves. Whether you do it or not, I think we kind of know when we've crossed a boundary or have done something that we're not proud of. It's part of growing. I've done it. You've done it. We've all done it. So you kind of figure out how to navigate. Of course, there are also those people who haven't figured that out yet. And they have no tact, really. They don't know how to assess a situation. They are very blunt, kind of just loose lips. They air their dirty laundry on social media, which it's all their choice, of course. But those are the kinds of people... We all know a few people like that, and it's kind of where you're like going through your Facebook feed and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm kind of cringing at what you just posted. I have secondhand embarrassment. Why would you ever say that in public? Or like, even if you have those thoughts, keep them to yourselves. We all know people like that. But for those of us who have kind of succeeded in carrying ourselves in a respectful or tactful way, it's almost like you assess the situation and you put on a different mask, if you will. Now... I don't know if the right word is manipulative, but it might be a little bit manipulative, but it's kind of how you assess it and move forward in life. You withhold the truth. You tailor things a certain way to just really kind of judge the situation you're in. And again, mostly it's done to just show a level of tact. Now, I know you're probably like, uh, what are you talking about? You're saying you wear a mask and you manipulate people? Uh, this channel isn't for me. What the hell was I thinking? And who the hell are you really? Let me just kind of give you an example because I know that could spend, send quite a few people and trolls off on a lovely tangent. So for example, if you were doing a job interview, you probably wouldn't tell this potential boss that you have been fired from all of your jobs, that you constantly show up late, that you really aren't even interested in the field of work, you just really need money. Some people do actually say all of that and lay it out on the table, but if you are wise or you've been through this before, you probably tailor it back a little and you probably put on a different mask and you probably say like, no, I'm really excited about this opportunity. I'm going to hype up all the accomplishments I've had from my other jobs. I'm never going to say that I, you know, was written up 20 times or whatever the truth may be. That's what I mean by this, kind of like manipulating and catering to the situation a little bit. And we also see this on social media when people put on this perfectionist mask, so to speak, and only show you the perfect side of their lives, their fancy house, their filtered decorations, their beautiful mansions, their perfectly groomed kids, their happy marriage with, you know, all the passion in the world, the highest sex drive in the world, like whatever it is, they put on this perfect persona and it helps them be happy, I guess, to show this side of themselves. They are happy with this version of themselves, and that's what they want to show. And a lot of the times, it makes people want what they have, right? Now, for a select few people, that mask that they temporarily put on becomes their identity, so to speak. 
even though they know that it's not real and that it's just a mask, it's almost like they decide to never take it off, hiding what truly lies beneath and who they really are. And it's those people that you want to look out for because they are the type of person or the type of criminal that really do scare me the most because when that mask comes off, nobody ever sees it coming. People like that are weak inside, and the thought of anybody knowing their true identity makes them feel like they are out of control. Even the people closest to that person may think that they know everything there is to know about them, their spouse, their children, whatever. They may go for years without ever seeing behind that fake smile or fake demeanor. That is until they lose control and the mask comes off. And when this happens to those certain individuals who crave control, it can turn deadly. On September 22nd, 2022 in Harris County, Texas, that's exactly what happened when bullets were sprayed and lives were lost, all while caught on camera. Takaira Glenn was born on January 4th, 1988 in Perea, Illinois. I hope I'm saying that right. Peora, Illinois, you, whatever. If you're from Illinois, school me in the comments. Kai had three siblings, Katera, the oldest, Tamra, and the youngest being Scott. Kai grew up most of her life in a single parent household with her siblings and with her mother. Kai was known to be the most courageous and adventurous out of all of the siblings. She enjoyed having fun and she loved the people who loved her. Kai became a teen mom at the young age of 17, and that's when she had her first daughter, Danielle. Now, Kai's sister Kat was married fresh out of high school and was married to a man who was in the Air Force. They were in Japan at the same time that a childhood friend of Kat named Greg was also stationed in Japan through the Navy. So he would come and visit Kat any time that he was docked in Okinawa. Even when her marriage fell apart, Greg would still come visit her whenever he came home to Illinois. The two of them, along with a few other friends, would link up for drinks, and then when Kai was finally of age to drink, that's when her sister Kat introduced her to Greg on one of his visits. Greg was also born in Illinois on May 19th, 1985. In his late teens, he moved to a new house in the area with his mother back over in 2002. Soon after he hit 18, Greg joined the Navy. He was deployed overseas for three years in Japan, and then when he came home, he was stationed in San Diego, California in 2007. When Greg and Kai met, he also had a child. He also had a child from a previous relationship. However, it's believed that the maternal family had custody, and I don't believe that Greg was very much involved in her life. So to Kai, Greg seemed like everything that she wanted and needed in a man. He was smart, handsome, stable. He also had a child, and he was in the Navy. To her and everybody else, he seemed like a normal, well-rounded man. Soon after Greg and Kai met, they began a relationship, and shortly after, they got married around 2009. In 2010, an article was put out for one of Greg's military accomplishments, and you'll actually see the irony in this article later, but let me talk to you about this article. So the article shows this slightly dramatic and misleading photo, and it goes on to say, Chief Damage Control Man Gregory Hightower teaches how to perform damage control procedures while inside a flooded compartment in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and it's dated January 5th, 2010. Without a doubt, Greg was a smart man and a smart businessman. He was working his way through the ranks. So what could possibly go wrong for such a cunning and charismatic man? Kai and Greg continued growing their family and moving all over the place. Now, Greg didn't want to pay for daycare, so Kai put her dreams and her aspirations aside for the man she loved and to raise their family. And we know that Kai loves hard and unconditionally, according to her family. So they're moving around, they're having children, his career is booming, Kai is, you know, taking care of her kids and being this loving, doting mother. And fast forward to 2022, the family lives in Humble, Texas, and they have grown to be a family with six beautiful children. Greg has everything he's always wanted, not only a beautiful family and a gorgeous wife and stay-at-home mother, but he also has multiple businesses. He has a book, he has large equities, he kind of has it all. Not to mention, he's also now the senior chief naval recruiter. So on the outside looking in, some of us would be jealous at such a happy life. But things aren't always what they seem, and no one would ever expect what would happen in just nine months. September 16th, 2022, an article came out about Greg purchasing and renovating the old Char Inn Motel back in Illinois, where they all grew up. This article talks about how Greg and his team have gutted this old abandoned motel and have plans to renovate it. 
But just six days later, those plans would be cut short. On September 22nd, at around 1.30 p.m., Kai was standing inside her home holding her youngest son, Gianni, who was 12 months old, and she was talking to two Naval Criminal Investigative Service agents who were taking down a report of DV from her husband, Greg Hightower. According to Kai's sister, Greg had been out of town the night prior working on this motel-hotel thing in Illinois, and Kai was having suspicions that Greg wasn't where he said he was. Coincidentally, one of her children's iPads she had and had just gotten repaired was able to track his location. So she was able to track him going to a hospital all the way in Champaign, Illinois from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. He apparently was meeting a woman who worked at the hospital named Alicia, who he also had dated in high school. When this woman was confronted by her own significant other, she told him that she had given Greg $2,500 to invest in his new hotel project. So first of all, seeing Greg going in the early hours of the morning slash middle of the night to meet up with some girl that he had dated in high school really bothered Kai. And not only that, but apparently Greg had been threatening Kai the entire time he was away, saying that he was going to kill her upon his return home. So with that, Kai gained the strength and courage to contact Greg's superiors and report what was happening. So those two armed agents were at the house, taking down her report, when the world as she knew it fell to pieces. Greg burst through the front door of their home with a loaded firearm in his hands. He shot Kai, killing her instantly, while their 12-month-old baby Gianni was still wrapped in her arms, and their three-year-old daughter was standing nearby. So the two agents began to engage in fire with Greg, and it became a shootout. Greg then picked up their three-year-old daughter, Gianna, and continued to fire at the agents with his daughter in his arm. And they were returning fire as well because it was a threatening situation until he managed to injure one of these agents critically. He then dropped his child, his own daughter, and fled the scene. The toddler and the agents ran to the neighbor Melissa Cario's home for cover. From one angle of a neighbor's security system to another, the barrage of bullets fired during an altercation Thursday along Tulik Run in Atascacita is frightening. All right, we're getting new details about a deadly shooting in Northeast Harris County. That is where a man killed his wife and injured an investigator. Tonight we are seeing and hearing how chaotic that scene was from a neighbor security camera video. KPRC 2's Bill Barajas is live in that neighborhood tonight with those new details. Bill. Well, we're learning more about that suspect and his wife, Harris County Sheriff investigators are telling us the couple had recently struggled with the issues. Friends and neighbors saying that the suspect was a Navy recruiter and shared six children with his wife at this home here just behind me on Tulich. It's unclear what caused Thursday's shooting, but we were able to obtain video showing the moments the shooting started. This quiet Balmoral community was shaken by gunfire. You can clearly hear the first shot. Several more follow. Agents with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service can be seen approaching the home. Several more rounds go off. The suspect was caught on camera chasing down one of two NCIS agents and firing multiple shots, eventually hitting and injuring one. Both agents and a child at the home ran to Melissa Carrillo's house to take cover. My instinct for, uh, it was close my door, my garage door with their inside, with my kid and they have another kid too. I was with the little kid when all this, the craziness. Do you know happened. how old he was? Was he young? I think three years old. The suspect took off and was eventually tracked down and shot at the Stone Mist Apartments in Northwest Harris County. His wife found dead holding one of their children in her arms. I never saw the guy or the mother. No, yeah. I never. I, mm, it's new for me. I just moved like a couple weeks ago. And again, the suspect and his wife have yet to be identified. Both children, including the one in his mother's arms and the one taken to Carrillo's home, were told were unharmed. The agent uh, that was shot is expected to make a full recovery. Greg had been hit by one of the passing bullets, and while injured, he drove 20 minutes away to his mother's house, where she called 911. 
Harris County Sheriff's Department found Greg sitting in his car in the parking lot where another shootout with officers ensued. After a short while, Greg was shot dead right outside his mother's house. Developing story now, investigators say a woman was killed while holding one of her babies. Her husband, who we're told is a military recruiter, is accused of killing her. That woman was murdered in Atascacita. The husband was later killed by deputies in Northwest Harris County. Our Kathy Hernandez is live with what neighbors are now telling us. Kathy? Good morning to you. A very sad situation. Neighbors say that woman expressed fear for her life. In the past, family members who were here on the scene told us that couple had been married for about 15 years, had multiple children, but recently struggled with. Two of those children were here at the time, investigators say, but they were not hurt. It's crazy. Never would have expected it. Nice family. Neighbors in the Balmoral community are stunned. Deputies say a man shot and killed his wife on Tulick Run in Bedford Miss Road at about four yesterday afternoon. The uh, suspect, uh, believed to be the husband, uh, you know, ran into inside the household while the female was carrying her infant child in her arms. Uh, it appears that he shot her. They say as the husband was getting away, he also shot an investigator with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service who responded to the scene. They're expected to survive. Investigators say the husband took off before they found him on Miss Lane and Jones Road, 25 miles away. They say after a shootout, deputy constables shot and killed him. And the policeman, before I knew it, in an instant, jumped out the car and I heard him holler like three or four times, put it away, put it away. Put it down, put it down, and boom, boom, boom. It was gunfire. And the husband is believed to be a military recruiter. That neighbor tells us he was set to retire next summer. Now, while you may be thinking, oh my God, this escalated quickly. What was going on from the night before when she had the iPad? How did it get to this? Just from the report of the DV, what the heck is going on here? And this is why this tragedy just angers me to no end. Because this wasn't just an isolated incident that escalated quickly, not by a long shot. So let's go back to July 2022. Apparently, years before this incident, Greg had always been condescending and threatening towards Kai, not to mention financially dominating her and not letting her have any control of money. He wouldn't allow her to get a job. He wouldn't allow her to control the money. He just wanted all of the power. And in July of 2022, this was the final straw. And this was the incident that everything escalated. Greg came home late at night with traces of glitter on his shirt. So Kai accused him of cheating on her. And she must have hit close to home because this angered Greg to no end. He grabbed her by the throat and threw her into the wall. And that was the first time that Takaira had the strength and courage to call for help. This incident scared her because I think she knew that Greg couldn't hide who he was anymore. The mask had fallen. She told the 911 dispatcher that her husband was choking her and being verbally abusive. When police showed up, though, Greg completely flipped the script on her. And the cops bought it hook, line, and sinker. And I don't know if this is because he is a senior chief naval recruiter, but clearly to them, apparently nobody in the military would possibly hit their wife ever. And if they had only even done a small investigation, like maybe interview the children, maybe they would have made the right decision and arrested Greg and put him in jail. Maybe. But they didn't. Instead, they just made the two of them separate for 24 hours. Sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Cough, cough, Gabby Petito in Moab, Utah, separate for 24 hours and then the, they end up dead later. Sounds pretty familiar, right? How about you just arrest them? So the second time that Kai had the courage to approach the Harris County Sheriff's Department and ask for help was two days before she was shot dead in her own home while holding her 12-month-old child. She had asked them about how to file a restraining order. So as if this story isn't already devastating enough, the fact that she has to ask for help in filing a literal piece of paperwork that she's going to have to wait to get signed off by a judge anyway. I mean, this system is just crazy to me. This man barged into his own home with two armed federal agents standing around his wife and continues to gun her down, disregarding the safety of both his youngest children and goes to then have a shootout with the agents on the scene. 
And it's almost laughable that a piece of paper like a restraining order that signed by a judge was going to do absolutely anything to stop this man. His children weren't stopping him. The federal agents weren't stopping him. How would a paper stop him? And Kai knew that the police weren't taking her seriously. That's why she made the one last-ditch effort to save herself and her children by going to Greg's superiors in this. And unfortunately, that only pissed him off more. In fact, she was so scared that she had been confiding in one of her neighbors, Terrell Hunter. And he said, We talked about it last night, and she told me that she was in fear for her life. I actually helped her lock up the house and get everything together, and then this happens. It's just crazy. A neighbor we spoke with says a wife told him multiple times in the past she was scared for her safety. It's a crazy day, you know. Yeah. We talked about it last night, and she told me that she was in fear for her life last night. And I actually helped her lock up the house and get everything together, and then this happened. So if only something was done back in July, maybe she would have had the chance she needed to get away. Greg's abuse had been slowly escalating as he was losing control over his wife. It started with verbal, and it slowly progressed into physical altercations, and then it became deadly. And it's so frustrating because this type of violence gets bypassed for lack of evidence. Which, what evidence exactly do you need? Do you need black eyes? Do you need broken teeth on the floor? Do you need a dead mother on the floor still holding her baby? How many times do we as a society have to watch women get killed because police don't arrest these innocent people something has to change in our justice system here guys and until that happens unfortunately ladies and men we need to look out for ourselves and for others don't drive a car without a dash cam put cameras around the main areas of your home and it may sound weird, but God forbid, if something happens, you'll have proof. Also, most of us know by now, put cameras all around your property and look out for each other. In this case, her neighbor apparently knew for weeks that she was being hurt by her husband. And he may not have known what to do, fair enough, but go to the police, give a witness statement, take her to a shelter, just please do something. And also, if you're ever experiencing something like this, please never be ashamed to call the DV hotline. It shows that you're strong and you're brave and that you're ready to get your family out of this constant chaos and possibly even an early grave. Now, my biggest fear in this case, and something that I honestly am pretty thankful for, is that the agents were there because I am fairly confident that had they not been, I think that Greg may very well have wiped out his entire family. In the end, Greg was one of those people who fooled the world by never taking his mask off. At least not to the people around him. Unfortunately, his wife and children got to see who Greg really was when that mask fell. He was a monster, a control freak, thinking that everybody else was the problem, not him, when he was the one who was out of control the entire time. It's a killer like Greg who scares me the most because you never see it coming. Or you do, and it's far too late. He couldn't stand the fact that his wife was leaving him and that she was discovering who he really was. So for him, it was better to destroy everything that he had worked so hard for in spite of her when all she ever did was love him and love their babies. Now I'm going to read to you from Kai's obituary. It reads, Miss Takara Kai Keshawan Glenn, 34 out of Humble, Texas, passed away on September 22nd, 2022 in Humble, Texas. She was born in Peoria, Illinois on January 4th, 1988 to Scott E. Scott Sr. and Chinitha Glenn. Kai's greatest joy and biggest accomplishment was becoming a mother. She enjoyed being pregnant, newborns, and baby smells. Her passion was being her children's number one fan, attending every basketball game, choir concert, and school event. She was there cheering them on. She also enjoyed interior decorating, traveling, cooking, listening to music, shopping for the kids, and capturing moments and posing for the camera. Kai leaves to cherish her precious memory. Her father, Scott E. Scott Sr., her mother, Chanitha Glenn, two sons, Gavin and Gianni, four daughters, Danielle, Gabriella, Giselle, and Gianna, all of Humble, Texas, one brother, Scott Jr., two sisters, Katera and Tamara, and a host of family and friends who loved her dearly. Kai was preceded in death by her maternal grandparents, Alphonse Glenn and Barbara Douglas, and paternal grandmother Anna Burns. Now, Kai's family is, of course, just grief-stricken, and they are also struggling financially to get the children who are left behind in this situation in a good home. 
Kai's sister Kat has stated that they are working on splitting up the children among her family members, which of course isn't ideal, but it's hard because everybody has kids themselves, so they're doing all of their best to support their sister and daughter in this just extremely horrible time. So I'm going to add her GoFundMe here, guys, in the description box. It's also the family's wishes that the Hightower name not be associated with their loved one anymore. So we are going to remember her as Takara Kai Kishana Glenn. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this case because I feel like I just covered one recently about a girl who documented her struggles in the same situation all through TikTok until, once again, it was too late. And I feel like we hear of these cases all too often. So is there a plan that can be put in place so that we don't have another situation like this? That instead of separating for 24 hours like this case or like Brian and Gabby or like so many others, there is something put in place or maybe even if they're separated for 24 hours, there's then a legal follow-up to make sure things are okay within the following 48 hours or something to just make sure that you're not just throwing them back into the lion's den. Because that's when it escalates, that's when control is lost, and that's when things like this become deadly. And not only that, but this guy, this piece of shit guy, literally shot at his wife, at the mother of his children, while she was holding their 12-month-old son, while their three-year-old stood next to her. Then, as a freaking coward, he grabs the three-year-old almost as like a shield, as though he thinks that by holding her, the agents aren't going to fire back at him, and puts her life in jeopardy. And then when he realizes, oh no, they're still going to shoot me, they're, you know, they're trying to subdue me, he tosses his three-year-old to the ground, as though she doesn't matter. So the trauma they're witnessing, everything that's unfolding, seeing their mother die, it's just horrible. And when she was hit the ground and was dead, she was still holding her son, never letting go of him. It's honestly devastating and just like shakes me in my core and makes me so upset. And these are also situations where I'm kind of torn, where I'm like, am I glad that he's dead or do I wish that he was in prison? And I wish that he was in prison. Although I'm happy he's dead in a weird way, I wish that he was in prison and had to face accountability for his actions. So he would have to sit in there and know that his kids hate him, that his kids, what the trauma that he inflicted on them, that he ripped their parents away from them. It's almost as though he got the easy way out here. And that bugs me. That really does. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, guys, but this case just is really getting to me. And I'm curious to know, what you think. Do you think that this could have been helped? Do you think he got preferential treatment because he was a senior recruiter with the Navy? Do you think they purposefully looked the other way? Or do we just have a broken system in general, regardless who you are, regardless what position you hold? All I know at the end of the day is shit like this is unacceptable. It is unacceptable, especially when there are so many red flags and warning signs along the way and documented concerns along the way. So I don't even know. I don't even know what to make of this, guys. Um, I'm curious to know what you think. So please leave your comments below and please, please leave your well wishes for Kai's family below in the comments too because as I mentioned, this is still very raw, very fresh for them and they could use as much support as they possibly can right now. And please keep all of those children in your thoughts and prayers. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in and until the next one, stay safe.